we're, we're talking today from the life of Simeon. And I had this uh, experience last night. I'm, I'm, so, I'm so blessed um, to be part of the family that I'm a part of. Uh, you know, everybody's got their birth family, and, and uh, I, I thank God for my parents. I thank God for my grandparents and, and, and for all that they deposited into my life. Um, later on in life, when I met Holly, I realized that her family had a, a, a strong spiritual, uh, you know, godly heritage uh, connected uh, all the way to her side of the family are Asbury's. And uh, so the Asbury clan, uh, of course, was, uh, is connected to Methodism, but then many of them got baptized in the Holy Spirit, been very active in the things of God for many, many years. And, uh, and you know, the things that when you, when you grow up in a kind of a displaced family, uh, my folks divorced when I was young, and so, uh, so that kind of splinters things. And, uh, and so Holly's family had held together, and what I noticed <clears throat> as kind of an outsider coming in, looking in, is that, uh, is that the patriarchs and the matriarchs uh, tell the stories, and, and they, they re-stamp the, the, the goodness of God on that family, the, the conversations that take place uh, around the table um, with the folks who are left, right? Uh, so, so, so powerful. And I've been the recipient of being able to sit in on those uh, meetings various times, not just Holly's family, but also family here in this room that uh, I've, been, I've been with you at your funerals and I've heard the stories, the good stories, the, the, the joyful stories about the testimonies. Uh, and the reason I bring all of that up today is not to have a personal nostalgic moment, but because Simeon's story is, is very much like that. When you hear Simeon's song, you see the guy who's been holding on to the faith for his entire life. And he sees the, he sees the Son of God come, and the Holy Spirit says, this is the one you've been waiting for. And just to see that moment, and then, uh, and again, through the lens uh, last night of uh, Uncle Hugh and Uncle Alfred that were telling the story. Alfred's in his 90s now. I didn't realize. He's over 90 now. And, uh, and, and Hugh Asbury. And, and to listen to Hugh talk about the goodness of God and the tears coming down his cheeks and saying, God has been so faithful, and, he, and coming out of poverty in West Virginia and, uh, and having nothing, and, and yet God blessing them through the years. That, that just encouraged my heart so much, you know. Um, let me tell you a quick story. I did an internship in Wading River, Long Island, uh, back when I was in college. And I met this preacher um, who was, uh, what was, he was on his deathbed, um, I can't even remember his name now, but his witness is is indelibly imprinted on my soul. Um, he had uh, he was telling us the story. He's a very tall man. I, I don't think he's probably like six five. I remember his feet sticking past the the end of the the bed, and uh, and he was telling this story with a with a, a brightness in his eyes. And he said, "When I started the church in Wading River, he said I, I had just come back from a a, a coast to coast." evangelistic tour. He said, I had a good job working for the train company. And he said, if you, had a, if you had a job for the train company, that was the one to have. And he said, but the Holy Spirit called me. And he said, you go preach my gospel. So he said, I quit my job. And he said, I left my wife there. She was in agreement. You got to follow the Lord. And so he said, I left my wife in, in New York. And he said, I traveled all the way to California and I preached the gospel based on Luke chapter 10. And I knew what he was talking about. Don't take anything for your journey. Just go and preach and the gospel will generate what you need. And so, so he said, I, I did my tour and I came back and he said, I decided I would plant this church. And he said, uh, it was pro probably about 10 of us in the, in the, in the Wading River churches is still uh, to this day, I don't think it's very big, uh, but it had maybe 15 or 20 people in it. And uh, he was describing the building that I, I was doing my internship at. And so he tells the story and he said, I, I, uh, he said, I preached the message and the Holy Spirit gave me such a clear word that there was going to be a certain amount in the offering down to the penny, and I can't remember what it was now, but it was he, he declared what the offering was. Now, this is you know, 10 or 12 people, and they're sitting there, and they're knowing that the offering is generated from them, and it was a large amount. 
And so this guy just like, he just walked himself on water right over, or, over top of there, you know, and they're like, oh, okay. You know, probably wandering around like Judas, is it I, Lord? Is it I? Who, who needs to give that offering? I don't know. And uh, so anyway, he preaches, and, and afterwards, you know, uh, you know they, they take up the offering, and, and uh, he said it, it got kind of quiet in the building, you know? And he said, pretty soon, he said, I hear this car. And he said the car drove around it. That there was a U U shaped driveway around the church, and it drove around back. And there was a there was a door uh, right off the platform. So like if you were if you were your preaching was really bad and they were throwing stuff at you, you could like exit stage right. You know, it's like he was too, he could have been out there. And and he said I I heard I heard a car pull around and a door open and a door close. And he said I he said the next thing I, he said I heard the car pull away. And he said, I got, uh, I wonder what that was, you know. And, and he said, it's just me and the, the treasure sitting around at that point. We're just because the offering wasn't what. And he said, I, I went over and I opened the door. And he said, there was a paper bag outside the door. And I opened it up and it had money in it. And I handed it to the treasurer, and the treasurer poured it out right there on the communion table into the offering container. And he said, you know what? It was exactly the amount exactly amount that the Lord told me to say. Now, here's here, all of that to say. This is the context of what, of, of what this man, what mattered to him. He, he laid there on his deathbed and wept and said, I was not a false prophet. I spoke what God put in my heart to speak. And God did what God said he would do. Praise God. I said, you know, that, that kind of fidelity to the word of the Lord, that kind of integrity to say, I only want to do what God wants me to do, and I only want to say what God wants me to say, and, and I'm going to hold fast to that word, and I'm going to cling to that word. See, that's what Simeon has going for him in, in our text today. So when we see Mary's song, we see the, the, the little inexperienced girl, maybe 13 years old, 12, 13 years old, and the angel comes and she's like, mm, don't, don't, can't add anything to this message, but be it unto me according to your word. Then you have Zachariah's song, and Zachariah was the religious guy um, who, who was a priest who would go in, and he, he had a little time under his belt, but he was leaning on, he was leaning on the tradition. He was leaning on what he understood to be right about how God worked in the world. And, and you know, when he questioned the Lord out of his unbelief, he, he struck dumb for about nine months, right? Until he can name his son John the way God wanted it to be done. And then the angels come to the, the, to the shepherds, and that communicates to us that God is not respecting the, the high above the low, that God in his divinity wants to make sure that the message of the gospel goes to the humblest of creatures. And so out on the, uh, the, the shepherds watching over their flocks, they hear this message that God is with us, that God is alive and he's doing a new thing. But what about a guy who had a word from the Lord and he held on to it his entire life? What about the person that, that said, I know this was God, but season after season after season doesn't see anything come to pass? Is it still legitimate? Is it still worth hanging on to, or should we just take that old faith and belief and stick it, you know, in a trunk somewhere and close it up? Is it for has-beens? What does it mean? to hold on to a word of the Lord for a long period of time. In Luke 2, 25, it says, Now there was a man in Jerusalem called Simeon who was righteous and devout, and he was waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. Remember we said Luke is the gospel of the Holy Spirit. 
If you spend time reading through the book of Luke and the book of Acts, you'll find that Luke identifies the Holy Spirit way more times than anybody else. This is some of those moments. It had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not die before he had seen the Lord's Christ. Moved by the Spirit, he went into the temple courts. Temple courts were quite large. There were a lot of people. He could have, he could have bumped into Mary's family and never even known who it was that he was bumping into. But he was moved by the Spirit. He was led by the Spirit from crowd to crowd to crowd to crowd until he finds this particular family. And when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him what the custom of the law required, Simeon took him in his arms and praised God, saying, Sovereign Lord, as you have promised, you now dismiss your servant in peace. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the sight of all people, a light for revelation to the Gentiles and for glory to your people Israel." The child's father and mother marveled at what was said about him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary, his mother, This child is destined to cause the falling and rising of many in Israel and to be a sign that will be spoken against so that the thoughts of many hearts will be revealed and a sword will pierce your own soul too. Father, I pray as we look into Simeon's life that we would do as Hebrews 13 says, Consider the outcome of those who spoke the word of God to us. To consider the outcome of their way of life and imitate their faith. Lord, we've not been called to imitate anybody else on the planet. Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. That we're all following Jesus, but Lord, we need to imitate the faith of those who have gone on before. In your name we pray. Amen. You know, in, in the birth of Jesus, you have, you have the greatest expression, <coughs> the greatest expression of divinity, the most light that has ever been seen in one place at any one time. If you look at it, and by that, I mean God showing up and doing things only God can do. There are over 300 different promises that point to the birth of Jesus that Jesus fulfilled let me, let me just mention this to you. Uh, one person fulfilling eight prophecies is, I think it's like over one trillion, uh, one trillion to one chances that that could happen. Just eight prophecies, just one person. Jesus has 300 prophecies, right? So, so if you were to think in terms of uh, 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 one person fulfilling 48 prophecies, it would be, uh, uh, a one chance in 10 to the 157th power. So for, to, for Jesus to fulfill 300, only God could do that. Only God can do that. And, and so, you know, when we think in terms of this coming of Jesus, remember we've talked about the term Advent, and the, the term Advent means the one who comes. Say that out loud. The one who comes. Um, a lot of times what you and I are looking for is a better day. We just want a better day. We, we, we want, uh, we want uh, more money. We want a better job. We want a better relationship. We want a better this, a better that. But what the Word of God promises us is not a formula and not a system, but a person. A person that the government is upon his shoulders, you see. And, and see, what you and I kind of do, and, and we don't do this, this is just human nature, we don't think this through. Um, but if I can get the formula, then I'm in charge of the formula. And I can use that formula however I want it to be used. If, if I could, if I could uh, uh, you know, we're doing healing teams right now. If I could figure out just how that everybody I would lay my hands on got healed, boy, that's, that's quite a gift. That's wonderful. But the, after a while then, though, it's me operating the gift however I want to. And God doesn't allow that. Advent is about who comes. Why? Because all authority in heaven and on earth belongs to him. It doesn't belong to me. It belongs to him. And so God wants to reveal himself in you. And the good news is 
He's willing to do that. He's done that for 2,000 years. He wants Jesus to be in you and you in him. And if you're in him, then Christ is being revealed in your life on a daily basis. Sometimes we don't look to see where he's at work. And sometimes it's because we're too disconnected from the rest of the family of God for somebody else to see where he's at work. Like he's at work in your life, but you're not close enough to the body for them to say, I see God right there. I see God right there. I see God right there. That's why forgiveness is so important. That's why loving one another is so important. That's why praying for one another is so important. Why? Because those are little glimmers of the expression of the divinity of the Lord. He wants to break through in your life, right? And, uh, and so, uh, you know, John the Baptist was the one who said, this was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has surpassed me because he was before me. So the, the principle of Advent that we celebrate every year at Christmas time is that he is the one who comes and the government is on his shoulders and you don't have to worry about your tomorrow because you've got a heavenly father who cares for you, who looks after you. Now, uh, I want to give some good news for those of us who are, who are ad well advanced in years. Let, let's, let's get some encouragement from Simeon's life here. So um, Simeon's example tells us several things. There are promises of God waiting to come to pass in our world, and if we don't watch for them and listen to them, uh, listen to the Holy Spirit, we can easily miss them. Simeon is one old guy in, a, in, a, in, in all of Israel who is watching for the consolation of Israel. And, and he, is, he is focused in, he is honed in, and he doesn't want to miss what God is doing. But it's possible that we can miss it. How many of you look back in your life and say, yep, I missed it right there. I missed it with this decision. I missed it with that decision. I, I could have done things better. I missed, I missed where I was supposed to go. Can God redeem your, your bad decisions? Absolutely. He does it all the time. He's a master at it. Could, have, could you have maybe uh, had more hair on your head because you, you had uh, made those decisions in, in a godly way? I probably could have. I could have saved, some, uh, I, I could have saved my soul a little bit of, uh, a little bit of issue. Oh, sorry, man. Here's, here's a few things we can learn from Simeon, right? Christ in you is the hope of glory. Christ in you is the hope of purpose. Christ in you is the hope of meaning and significance. And Christ in you is the hope of wholeness. Simeon lived to see Christ. He lived to see this little baby. He lived to see the one who was going to come and fulfill every promise that the Father had ever wanted to bring to pass. And so the, God's kingdom is a presence-based kingdom. He wasn't looking for a new system of government. He wasn't looking for another formula. He wasn't looking for a better season than they had last year. He was looking for the one. The one who would change everything. The one in whom God had invested all of his authority. He, so, so he wasn't looking for a different political system to take power. He was looking for the one. Church, if we could be single focused on saying what is Jesus doing in our midst. If we could just focus in on that. Not even just principles are wonderful, but it's presence that brings authority. And when Jesus shows up, he brings his presence among us, his authority to, to enact what he wants to do, his, his authority to draw people to himself, right? And so we need his presence. Uh, when the king comes, he brings his authority and his power, which brings the signs and wonders and cause people to put faith in him, not in eloquent words, but in the power of God. So Simeon's purpose in life was to watch the word of the Lord come to pass, and he lived for a word he knew was spoken over 700 years before his life. Think about that. I think one of the realities of living in a, in a culture that uh, the next gadget is always better than the last, and your phone is outdated six minutes after you buy it. One of the dangers of that is we throw the old, you know, into the, into the dustbin, and 
and yet we forget that the promises of God are eternal, that they come, you know, before we were ever born, right? He was thinking about us. The promise of your life happened before the foundation of the world. And what you will be has not yet been made known. So you got to hang on to the promise of God for a while. And that perspective comes when you sit and you talk with the elders and then you'll say, you know, I remember 40 years ago and they start telling the story and that promise is still alive on the inside of them. If you don't have that benefit of family sitting around or, or, or the people of God sitting around talking about how, how long it takes for things to come to pass, you know what, we all just kind of need to settle down and not be as impatient, right? I'm preaching to myself, man, I'm telling you. Yeah, that's right, call me to account, right? Call me to account. Simeon cradled God's promise in his heart long before he held him in his hands. What is the promise of God that you're holding in your heart? What has God spoken to you about your life, about your family, about, uh, uh, about the, your vocation in, in your space in life? What has he spoken to you that you're holding on to and you're saying, Jesus, if I could have one thing I'm hoping for, it's that you would come through in this area and you just hold on to it and you hold on to it and you hold on to it and you look at that promise over and over and over again. Um, Here's, I'm going to give you a definition of a word here. Um, he, he, says, he says something unique. He said, Father, I can now depart from here. I can now depart. Now, this word depart in the Greek has several meanings. This is in your notes. I'm sorry I didn't, uh, I didn't uh, uh, mention to you about version. I'm reading all the version notes, so you can go into version and pop up the events tab, and it's in there. The word depart in the Greek has several meanings, and each of them tells us something about the death of a Christian. It means to release a prisoner, to untie a ship and set sail, to take down a yoke, I mean, excuse me, to take down a tent and to unyoke a beast of burden. So Simeon, think about that. Simeon had been holding on to this promise his entire life, and yet he, he felt like he was a prisoner. He was holding the promise, but the promise was also holding him. It's very narrow. I, I, I can't go do my own thing. I'm holding on to the promise. And, and the promise, I have the promise, but the promise has me. And, and so as soon as he sees Jesus, he says, oh, I'm released. I'm released. I'm no longer a prisoner to this thing that I've been holding on for so long. That's beautiful, isn't it? Um, to untie a ship and set sail. I'm reminded of that uh, in the, the story about the, the hobbits, right, at the end of it. And, you know, and, and it, there's a ship, isn't there? And that ship, that elven ship is going to go on on into the wherever, you know. And, uh, and so, uh, you know, there's, there's something about when you were, you were created for, f- to be a, a container of the word of the Lord, and when that word comes to pass, that's when your ship really sails. You're, you're in a holding pattern the entire time until you see the fulfillment of what it is that God has for you, and then there's that moment in time that you can, you can step out there and you can say, yes, now we can do what ships were made for. We can sail. We can go forth into uh, onto the horizon. We can we can get out away from land to untie that ship and set sail. Thirdly, to take down a tent. You know the the, the Bible says that your body is just a tent. I mean, I tell my wife all the time, your tent looks amazing, baby. <laughs> I'm about to get in trouble. <clears throat> My wife went in for her mammogram. And, and you know, the nurse says, do you, do you have any lumps? Do you have anything going on? She says, no. My husband says no. My husband says it's all good. (laughs) 
Anyway. I just wanted to make sure you're still awake. Your tent looks good, baby. I'm back on track now. Lastly, to unyoke a beast of burden. You know, the, the, the chore of, of, this, of this mule, the chore of, of, this, uh, of this donkey, the chore of this beast of burden, this oxen. It's been carrying the load, carrying the load, carrying the load. Finally comes the day that it can be released from its, you know, from that burden of care of whatever it was that it was carrying. And so Simeon says, I've carried this word my entire life. I've waited for its fulfillment. And when he sees this little baby, he said, oh, here he is. This is what I've been waiting for. This is what I've dreamed about. I've dreamed about this hour. I've dreamed about this moment. Friends, can you get a hold of a, the word of the Lord for yourself this morning? Can you start carrying the load of the word of God on the inside of you for your family, for a community, for a job? Can you, can you get in there and say, you know what, I want everybody in my family to be born again. I want everybody in my workplace to know Jesus. I'm waiting for God to show up and move in this situation. And, and so you begin to partner up with the Lord. He said, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So it's not so much that you can't carry it, but you're carrying it with him. He's carrying it with you. And it happens time after time that, that we need to recognize there's a burden of the word that we need to carry. Okay, so uh, I'm gonna rattle through these and, and I, I hope that it's gonna touch you somewhere and uh, it's gonna make sense to you. Simeon, number one, Simeon waited patiently for the Father's plan. What part of Father's plan for your life are you still waiting for to complete? For some of us, we, we, we haven't really um, got that revelation from the Lord yet. We're still waiting to hear, okay, I'm, I don't know what my place is in this world. I'm not sure, I'm not sure what my voice is. We spend in our, our, our 20s, we try to figure out what our vocation is. What am I gonna do for the rest of my life and who am I gonna spend it with? And we're trying to figure all of that stuff out. But even in those moments, the Holy Spirit will talk to you about the theme of your life. He'll talk to you about things that, the things that you're passionate about, the things that, you, that get you stirred up. I remember in high school, I was working on a custom home project down in Western North Carolina, and, uh, and I remember I was helping uh, build the, the owner. This was his third house, and, uh, and it was an amazing house, and, and I loved the, the intricacies of what was taking place. But inside, I was saying, there are people in the world that don't even have a tin roof over their head. And I'm building this man his third house. And it's a 2,500 square foot guest house in preparation for his mansion that will be built on these 50 acres in Western Carolina. And there was just something in my young soul that I was saying, there's, there's gotta be more. This is, this is like, he's just throwing money at this thing and, and yet there's not a lot of meaning. Does that make sense? And, and I realized that I was in this place in my life where I was gonna have to make an adjustment because there was a stirring down on the inside that was deeper than, did I need the job? Absolutely, you're always gonna need a job and you're always gonna need money. But what are you doing to carry that word of the Lord that he puts down on the inside of you? And then, and then you begin to move on that and here's the, here's the thing I want you to, to begin to think about. And I don't think... I was having this conversation with Mark Mason probably about a month and a half ago, and we were, he was telling me, rehearse the story and stuff, you know, that uh, I, I, had, uh, I had my staff come over to our house on Ferry's Mill a number of years ago when uh, Doug Hollis, who's a missionary to Indonesia, he's with the Lord now, and Doug was just a, he was an apostle. That guy, he probably spoke seven languages. He had 200 plus church planters in Indonesia, militant Hinduism that he was dealing with. Um, Doug had more surgeries internally than anybody I'd ever met, probably 40 or 50 different surgeries, cancer. He, he didn't have all of, all of the organs that were left in his body, weren't all the ones that he started with. I mean, it was just a lot, a lot of stuff. And, uh, and, but at that time, Doug was fairly good health, and he was in my, my uh, living room, and he started talking about this word, convergence. 
And Mark Mason brought it up to me the other day because I think it was the first time I'd ever heard that word. And, and, and Doug said, hey, there's this book, and it really meant a lot to me, but here's the thing that you need to look for in your life. He said it's when, it's when you, you, you watch the Lord, uh, you know, help you develop who you are and what your voice is. And it, he talked about it's really kind of like the word kairos, right, where, where the will of God and the timing of God finally coincide. And, and if we're younger, we want to sprint to it. If I can get to that one location, then I'll be exactly where I need to be, you know, but really, you won't be the right person when you get there because you'll get there too early, and then you'll get bored. And he'll say, ha, huh, I got all this life left. There's got to be something more. So the pursuit of it is not just about getting there. It's about the changes that happen in your life in the journey. The preparation of who you are, the, the character that needs to be established, the stop taking the shortcuts, the settle down, the pay attention to your relationships because they're gonna serve you your whole life, so stop burning bridges. Be reconciled. Let the fruit of the Spirit, you know, mature in your life. And, and so, uh, so this idea of convergence, and so Mark Mason brought that back up. He said, you know, I never told you how bad I hate it. I just wanted to go home after church and lay on the couch. He said, but when Doug started talking about convergence, he was prophesying into the future of my life that I'm just now experiencing at 60 years old. Some of y'all thinking you missed it. You're just warming up. You're just warming up. You know, and, and so where is it that God is working in your life? Where are you holding on to the word? Secondly, Simeon, welcome the Holy Spirit's presence and ministry. While you're waiting for fulfillment, be filled with the Holy Spirit in the meantime. There's that word that we spent a lot of time on this year, in the meantime. What are you doing in the meantime? Don't waste time. Redeem it. Buy it back. Stay filled with the Spirit. Park the ark and keep the motor running. Do some prayer walking. You know, spend some time in the word. Let it strengthen you. Let it enrich you. You know, let it grow on the inside of you. What are you doing in the meantime? I don't know how much time it took for Simeon to do what he was doing, but he kept his focus on the things of God. He participated with the Holy Spirit. Let me tell you, uh, you know, he probably practiced following the leadership of the Holy Spirit. He probably woke up that morning and said, Holy Spirit, show me, is it today? Is it today? And he might have been doing that for 70 years. Is it today that I'm gonna see, I'm gonna see the fulfillment? Is it today? And he would get up and he would follow the leadership of the Holy Spirit. How good are you at following the leadership of the Holy Spirit in your life? Do you just live your life kind of by happenstance? Or can you say like Jesus, I only do what I see my Father doing? I only say, ooh, this is a hard one. Like I want to ask people that say, well, yeah, that's me. I'm a, I'm a Christian. I only say what the Holy Spirit tells me to say. I'm like, can we just rewind that the last two days of your life? And let's check that. Let's check that against the word. Let's check that against, you know. Really? Holy Spirit told you to say that? <laughs> Number three, Simeon worshiped God vocally and publicly. He wasn't silent about his worship, nor should we be silent. When was the last time you said something about Jesus? And let me tell you, the world is saying we can have our smoke breaks. Why can't you step out and have a praise break? So many things begin to shift around when you start lifting up the name of Jesus publicly. Hallelujah. Praise God. You're, the, you're in the Wawa line. Praise the Lord. They'll get out your way, man. Here comes that crazy Christian. Get him through the line as quickly as possible. Divine appointments on aisle five. Praying for the sick on aisle 12. Come on down, right? 
Number four, Simeon willingly released the prophetic word to the world when we have a word and are filled with the Spirit and we worship God acceptably. There will come a prophetic shout. Did you see where he, he was rejoicing in God and at and one minute he was saying, Lord, now you can release me. I'm ready to come home. I've seen the consolation of Israel. And he praises God and in the next minute, he begins to prophesy. He begins to speak into the next generation. Can I tell you, he's talking to a 14-year-old carrying a baby in her arms. And he begins to tell her about her child. He begins to tell her about the word. He's taking from within himself a word that is over 700 years old. And he speaks it into the next generation. Come on. That's awesome. And he speaks it into the next generation. Why? Because the next generation needs the word of the Lord. It ain't all done yet. It ain't all done. And so, so he begins to prophesy to Mary. He begins to tell her about her son. He begins to speak this word of the Lord that he's been, that's been marinating on the inside. He's incarnated this word. And now he speaks this rhema word to Mary that she hangs on to for the rest of her life. Think about that. You see how God brings the generations together in this picture? Do you see how God is, is moving to, to, to accomplish his word? But we've got to be faithful with our part. And so he prophesies into the next generation. Lighthouse, I hope you can find yourself somewhere in, somewhere in Simeon's story. Somewhere in Simeon's story. What has God put you on the planet to do? I, I, I dress up this phrase, but I ask it periodically, and usually it's around this time of the year, uh, but also to any team members that are coming on board with me because I want to make sure that we're, we're, you know, we're, we're singing off the same sheet of music. What is the field of endeavor that Jesus is going to talk to you about when you see him face to face? Because you're in your field right now. But some of you don't know what your field is. You're in the season that Jesus is going to revisit with you. Are you wandering around? Or are you diligent with what God has put down on the inside of you, the eternal part of you that's going to last forever? Well, that's just another car, or that's just another house, or that's just another job. Well, while you're getting just another, what are you hanging on to that you know that Jesus is going to talk to you about? What are you holding fast to and saying, man, this is the revelation. I've had it from very young. I've had this for a very long time. What are you hanging on to? Amen? Let's stand this morning. We're going to go ahead and close out. I think we've got somebody coming to share some announcements, take up the offering. I'm looking forward to tonight. I'm also looking forward to next week. We're going to have a prayer time. Uh, we're going to have prayer stations in here in the evening for, uh, for New Year's Eve. And we're going to be praying over people and uh, praying into the new year and really just uh, asking the Lord, what's the scripture that you're, you're emphasizing? But then also, is there a prophetic word that God wants to speak into your life? And, uh, you know, those things, hold fat, learn to hold fast to those things. Father, I thank you for my brothers and sisters here. And I thank you, Lord, for anyone that may have wandered in and doesn't know Jesus but Lord, I pray today that they would, they would allow the seed of the word to, to take a hold of them today. That they would know the truth and the truth would make them free. Jesus, you said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father but by me. So today, Jesus, we look to you. We don't want a formula. We don't want a get-rich-quick scheme. We don't want five steps to raising better kids. We want Jesus. We want the word of the Lord. We want revelation on the inside. We want the life that comes from you. So today, Lord, we receive your life. Can all, we all say that together? Today, Lord, we receive your life. We receive all that you have for us. Thank you that you revealed yourself through your son and through your word to make us strong and to make us whole. In your name we pray.